So let's look at the third era, which we said it started, you can see that, that the boundaries between eras are not that simple to define because of the involvement of multiple actors. So one example of the change we already seen in 2008 with the European Environment Agency opening it up and uh, collecting information from the public but we can see it becoming something that is globally accepted by the uh, uh, early 2012-2015. For example, uh, in a global event which was called Iron Earth Alliance, which include uh, organized by Abu Dhabi a um, global initiative on environmental data, and the uh, UN Environmental Program, the Group on Earth Observation, the World Resource Institute, and uh, the International Organ uh, Organization, Union on Conservation of Nature, um, they actually said within a declaration at the end of the event that uh, citizen science is a major focus and it's also seeing it as a very important element uh, which should be as part of the sustainable development goal. Also, you could see the beginning of organizational transformation. So, for example, the European Environment Agency in its work program was saying that uh, it will widen and deepen a European knowledge base on developing uh, communities of practice and engaging partnership on that, but also having initiatives concerning lay, local and traditional knowledge and also citizen science. The awareness to this citizen science uh, became more apparent as we're going through this decade. So, for example, it appeared in the Oxford uh, English Dictionary in 2014 as the scientific work undertaken by members of the general public often in collaboration or under the direction of professional scientists and scientific institutes. And because environmental information is being produced by so many environmental bodies, this is something quite central to the production of environmental information. And actually, it's got a very long history. It's only that uh, the um, scientists and scientific institutions were acting as intermediaries. So, for example, in uh, recording phenology, the changes in of the seasons, or doing uh, bird watching and recording of it through the British Trust of Ornithology. Some of its work and some of its surveys are can be linked to a silent spring and it started in the early 60s and a study in 2012 of uh, the number of programs that are recording ecology and that can be used for different decision making identified over 234 projects in the UK. Also there were starting to be examples of community-led projects like a noise mapping that was carried out again at around the same time when the environment, the European Environment Agency was doing its own citizen science activities uh, and trying to encourage people to monitor beaches. Um, it, UCL, we work together with communities around Royal Docks, uh, around London City Airport to record the level of noise in order to deal with an issue of airport expansion. And in 2010, uh, because there was a phenomenon of a, a volcanic eruption that stopped all flights for a period of 10 days, it was possible to carry out a study where the community itself recorded the level of sound that they get during the um, period when there are flights and a period when they don't have flights and they could demonstrate the difference of all the cumulative impacts of the area. 
So when you are without the flight, you could demonstrate that the area is much more quiet and actually have a baseline, something that for organized uh, science will be more difficult because of the slowness of issuing an activity and going out to the field and doing all the work that involved in it. What is also interesting is that by the end of the 2010s, we actually get a end of the uh, sorry 2000. So with the evolution of the iPhone somewhere in 2007-8, uh, smartphones are starting to appear and allowing communities to use them in different ways and different applications for the monitoring of uh, noise level are appearing. So examples include the first application of its kind called Noise Tube that was developed in Belgium, but also an application from the European Environment Agency called the Noise Watch, and an application called Wide Noise that was developed uh, as part of a European project everywhere. And they could be used by large group of people in, and that's an example of work around Heathrow where not only the level of noise is being captured but also the views and uh, opinions of the people that are involved in it is recorded on the map. The issue of access of to information itself continue also to evolve. So for example this uh, understanding of the journey from uh, 1992 with Principle 10 has continued to evolve across the world and this is an example with uh, Latin America in something called the Escazu uh, Convention that now is being enacted and being accepted and bringing in the access to information and access to justice to new countries. So we see that although in some places we're moving towards citizen science, other places are still uh, building up their basic capacity of public access to environmental information. So if we're talking now about this third era, what we're seeing is increased proliferation of geographic technology, of information sharing, of ubiquitous computing in the form of smartphone and the emergence of citizen science. We see that official data is opened and integrated into community-led data collection activities. And now we are moving into a much more complex network where information is being produced by the public for the public, but also uh, experts are involved both in producing and facilitation. So if we go back to our diagram, we see that it's now a much more complex interaction because if the public is also producing information and the experts themselves are producing information, the relationship with decision-making and the government are becoming more complex.